they will repent of their sins, they will be glorified along with the church, and they will occupy her land with joy, obedience, and incomparable fruitfulness. What grace! The valley of Achor, the valley of trouble, even there it can become a door of hope. And only Jesus can take the valley of trouble and make it the door of hope.
I'm going to ask you to take your Bible this morning. Go ahead and find Joshua chapter number 7. Joshua 7. I'm not going to spend <clears throat> much time this morning on the introduction except to say that this is going to be a tough message to preach and it's going to be a tough message for you to hear. That being said, I really believe it is very much needed today in an age of a church climate that has grown very indifferent to both the committing of sin and the horrific consequences of sin. And I use the word church there universally, not specifically referring to higher ground. If you notice the title for the message perhaps on the screen this morning, then everything that I just said doesn't seem to go together with that title, The Door of Hope. But I'll just go ahead and tell you that the title won't make any sense until I get right down to my final conclusion this morning. So without any more delay, let's read about one of the most tragic accounts in all of the 66 books of the Bible. Stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. I'm reading beginning in verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, and the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth -haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan? to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us, would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore thou allowest thus upon thy face. Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the cursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify 
the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, thou canst stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. So in the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by her tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken, and he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus, and thus I have done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian uh, garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent and silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with them took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them into the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned him with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. And Father, there needs to be a holy hush that falls over the house of God this morning. Because, Lord, this is a serious matter. This is a serious issue. We see it right here in the very words on the pages of this great book, the Bible, Lord, of the horrible consequences that can come from transgressing the law of God. Lord, for those that are already there, tucked away, in the tent of their life, some pet sin or some transgression. Lord, I pray that this story will serve to arrest their conscience back to life and they will come to a place of repentance and forgiveness today. Lord, for those that may have taken a step toward the accursed thing, I pray that this will stand as a grave warning, Lord, to turn back now while there's time. For those today that are walking in holiness and righteousness, Lord, that it will again remind them, Lord, that they're on the right path. It's the correct way and to stay on it and continue on it, Lord, and not get off of that straight and narrow path that Jesus died to put us on. Lord, I pray for the person that's never come to know Christ, that it'll be a reminder, Lord, that sin never leads to anything good. And, and Lord, if they've not been born again and not been forgiven of their sin, Lord, that what happened to Achan and his family, will, it will occur to them, Lord, that that's minor compared to their fate, and they too will be born again. So, Lord, I believe this morning, Lord, that you're going to use this message. I trust that you will, Father, and I'm going to believe you for it. Spirit of God, right now, take the Word of God and implant it in the hearts of people that it might produce your intended result. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. And you can be seated. So this morning as we deal with this story, this tragic, tragic story, I want to try to guide us through this text this morning. And the first thing that we need to give some attention to this morning is what we discover here in the text, which is the compromise. If you've been following along with us, Israel has just been involved in the greatest military conquest in their history. They have just witnessed the tremendous defeat of the 
city of Jericho and they are still basking in the glow of that great victory. They thought that they were standing on the edge, I think, of a great string of victories that would see them conquering the entire land of promise. Yet what they didn't know at this point that there was a problem. There was now sin in the camp of Israel. Let me just give you a principle this morning. Right after great spiritual victory, you are very susceptible to compromise and defeat. Right after those revival meetings, right after finally getting a breakthrough in your life, right after coming off that conference experience or whatever the case may be, we are tempted after great victories, I think, to let our guard down. So the call for vigilance after a victory needs to be as great, if not greater, than what it was prior to the battle. Alan Redpass says, Mark this lesson well in your own Christian life. There is no experience in Christian living so full of danger as the flush of victory. You're going to come to a service at church today, I, I pray, and, and it is spirit-filled service. You, you're going to have your heart lifted and your spirit lifted by great music. Uh, uh, you're going to be encountering the Lord through the Word of God. You're going to be a part of the sweet fellowship. Do you know when you may encounter your greatest temptation this afternoon or in the morning? Can I get a witness? I mean, when the Lord moves, I think the enemy moves in response to that. But I can tell you this morning, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. Amen? You see, you see, the victory you won today will not bring you power for tomorrow. So always be careful. It's a word of caution to us. Always be careful after great spiritual victories. Now, back to the story. There was one in the midst of Israel who was causing the problem for the entire family of God. There was a man in their midst who had compromised. Verse 1 says that the name of that man was Achan. And Achan had taken of the accursed things. You remember when God promised Israel victory over Jericho? He said, when you go into this city and you defeat them, you do not take of the goods. You do not take of the spoils. He specifically designated this first victory, the spoils being for the treasury of the Lord. So chapter 6 ties up all the loose ends of Israel destroying the city and taking these spoils for God's treasury, the silver, the gold, and the bronze, but not Achan. He takes for himself, the, as the Bible designates, the accursed things. It is the word cherim, not cherub, cherubim, but cherim. It means a thing under a ban. This describes some particular object or some particular activity that you and I, as the people of God, are to stay away from. It is banned. In this particular instance, no one was to take of the spoils for themselves. It was to be totally devoted to God. So Achan compromised and took of the spoils for himself. That which was banned by Almighty God, he took back to his tent and carefully took to, tucked it away. And as far as he was concerned, he thought evidently out of the sight of man and even out of the sight of God. And the day that he buried those items under his tent, he too buried the seeds of rebellion. And the seeds of sin would take root quickly and would bring incredible and devastating results, listen to me, not only to his life, but to the life of his family, and yes, even to the life of the nation. I just want to go ahead this morning and say that compromise is never worth it. Never. Sin does pay, but the wages of sin are death. And I'm just warning you this morning, don't go down that road. The compromise you indulge in today will spell your defeat and your doom tomorrow. You cannot break God's law with impunity. You will have to pay. Hey, church, listen to me. Don't partake of the accursed things, those things that are banned by God. On occasion, some people choose to scoff 
at God as being some kind of cosmic killjoy who just arbitrarily sets these rules for us to follow. They, they view him sometimes as some type of mean spirited deity given the task of running or even ruining our lives. All these restrictions that we read in this book, things like the Ten Commandments. But church, I want you to hear me this morning. All of those things are the overtures of God's love for us. Amen? When God is telling us, don't you do this, when God is saying, don't do that, He is saying that because He knows that we are about to go over a cliff and plunge to our death. So He's saying, stop! You're going to regret it. You see, therefore, God has banned some things. And oh, if Achan had just listened to God, I'm telling you that you cannot enjoy the pleasures of sin apart from the wages of sin. So in chapter 6, verse 18, it says that when you take of the accursed thing, that the curse comes with it. Now, we're not talking about a curse like a witch or a magic or something like that. But the idea is this, in this particular case, we're talking about a set of unchangeable consequences that comes with every seed of sin. There is a striking parallel here that we must not miss. God says of the spoils of Jericho, they're his. That's what he says back in chapter 6. They're his. They're supposed to go into the treasury of God. You see, normally it was common for the army, the, 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 the victorious army, to partake of the spoils of victory. As a matter of fact, when we do get into Ai later on and God gives them victory, he allows them to partake of the spoils. If Achan had only been patient, he would have got it eventually anyway. So it was normally the case when the army would would take of the spoils. But see, Jericho represented the first fruits of the land. And God had claimed those first fruits for himself. So watch this, church. We are partaking of the accursed things when we do not give God all of the first fruits. Now, don't shout me down by not tithing according to Malachi chapter 3. Just listen to this striking language found in Malachi 3. He said, Well, a man robbed God, yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Then listen to this. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Now, there are people here in this building today who I venture to say, would say, I cannot believe that Achan did this after God explicitly told him to, and they'll say that while they have one hand in the pocket of God robbing him because they do not give God what is rightfully his, the first fruits, which is the tithe. Now, how'd you like that? And listen to me. There's a curse that is attached to that. And, I, and I'm telling you this morning, your finances will be cursed. You'll never have the blessing of God on your finances. Now, some would say, you know, Pastor, I don't tithe and I'm doing just fine. Well, imagine what it might be if you were tithing then. Amen? And you can have some nice things and drive a great car and live in a nice home and still not have the touch of God on your finances. Some would say, I don't tithe and I'm doing... Listen, why don't you take of the accursed things and get rid of them and give that which is rightfully God's back to him. Now, my desire in preaching this message is that each of you would search your hearts this morning and examine your life. If there's any area, any area, not just tithe, any area of compromise in your life, it's not going to end well for you. That's the point of the text. So we see the compromise. Secondly, we see the catastrophe this story turns tragic in a hurry. It moves from bad to worse in a hurry. You know, I was studying about Achan in this story, and I, a verse in Proverbs came to my mind, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, that says a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Achan went after the accursed riches and ruined his name. To this day, in circles among believers just like us, 
This is what we think of when we hear the name Achan. We think of the man that did what God told him not to do and lost his life and the life of his family. When we hear his name, we immediately think of compromise and sin. When people hear your name, what will they think of? What will you be known for? How will you be remembered? When we hear the name of Joshua, we think, man of God, man of integrity, a mighty leader, a difference maker. But now we're just looking at catastrophe. Let me point out several things here under catastrophe. Some things I want you to see. One thing we see here is a displeased Lord. In verse 1, the Bible says, The anger of the Lord was kindled. God was not pleased. In fact, church, He was angered. There seems to be, to me, something that has been lost in today's professing generation of Christians. Kind of this thought of God never really gets upset at us. God is just love, 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 and God is just mercy, mercy, mercy. God's just simply forgiving and patient. And while I would without question not deny that He is all those things and so much more, However, if that's all we say, then we have an imbalanced understanding of the entirety of the personhood of who God is. And when that's all we ever hear is love, 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 and mercy, 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 when that's all we ever hear, then people begin to think they can sin. They can sin with impunity. They can sin without tragic results. It's almost like people think that they have a kind of diplomatic immunity. Oh, we can just sin and God will just forgive us and we'll go on with our lives. We have chosen to forget that God burns with anger when we take of the accursed thing. And listen, we should talk more. We should talk more of the displeasure of God so that the weight of people's sins can come to bear on their souls with the hope that it'll lead them to genuine repentance. Instead, we try to pet it and make light of everything. There'll be some girl that'll get pregnant out of wedlock and the church will throw a baby shower, pat her on the back, and tell her everything's okay. No, God is displeased. And the weight of that sin, y'all don't shout me down, the weight of that sin needs to crush her until she quakes and quivers before God and repents in sackcloth and ashes. And after there's evidence that she has been forgiven and has made repentance and made right with her church family and made right with God, then... Throw the baby shower and rejoice and revel in the forgiveness and restoration of Almighty God. Amen? And that goes for the boy that got her that way too. Amen? We'll have a, don't clap yet. We'll have a man and a woman living together outside of wedlock. And the church will kind of approach it with a cliche kind of thing. Oh, why don't you just go ahead and make her an honest woman? No, God's anger burns and He is greatly displeased. Let that weigh on those individuals until they shake before God and repent. And then we can rejoice in the restoration and forgiveness that's found in Jesus Christ. Church, make no mistake about it. God was displeased and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must never act pleased when God is displeased. In most cases, the modern church has abdicated its responsibility to exercise church discipline in favor of a more user-friendly approach. May it never be. We must be displeased, as, as, as displeased as is the Lord Himself and help people and enable people instead of patting them on the back to come face-to-face -face with their sin so that they can repent and we can have an actual fellowship where the church is moved toward being right with the Lord instead of playing games and just brushing over things with the hope that it'll be quiet and nobody will ever find out. May it never be. It was a displeased Lord. Number two, there was a defeated army. Verse 5, And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them. 
Compared to Jericho, Ai was nothing. Joshua knows this. He sends a small delegation of soldiers up there to dispatch of Ai quickly, but they get routed and come running back to camp with their tails between their legs. So God makes a chilling statement in verse 12. He says, neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Because there was sin in the camp, Israel could not be victorious. You see, you thought you could sin without affecting anybody else. Wrong. Often the greatest problems faced by the church come from within, not from without. It's the water on the inside of the boat that's the problem, not the water on the outside of the boat. Amen? You see, had Israel been right with God, they could have defeated Ai with any number of troops, including just two or one, because when God's with you, you're always in the majority. All they did to defeat Jericho was march around and shout and blow trumpets. They sent a garrison of troops up to Ai, and they can't even win because there's sin in the camp. Boy, that says a lot for the church, doesn't it? Let me tell you something. Achan's sin was a greater problem for Israel than were the soldiers of Ai. And sadly, what took place at Ai has been duplicated in thousands of churches all over the world. Instead of enjoying the Lord's blessings, his frown can be upon them and often is upon them. So instead of overcoming the enemy, they're often humiliated before the enemy. Oh, listen, there may be some churches that even have some growth, but they don't have standards. They don't have the righteousness of God. That's the standard for the church. And so they think because they've got a big crowd, the smile of God's on them. But it's just a placebo, and God is not pleased with just big numbers. Oh, we want them, don't we? Let's just make sure it's the right kind of growth. Can I get an amen? Please hear your pastor. The greatest need in the church at this very hour is not better programs and better this or better that. The greatest need in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is holiness among the membership. Amen. A defeated army, a displeased Lord. Number three, a discouraged people. Verse five, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Now, you remember back in those early chapters, God said that the enemy's heart's going to melt before you. But now it's their hearts that have melted. They have gone from the remarkable victory at Jericho to a kind of defeatist mindset. Men whose jaw was set like flint and who had lead in their shoes are now like jello, and they don't even want to proceed forward any far anymore with the campaign that God's put before them. Sin will do that. It will completely disarm you and rob you of any desire to continue in the quest that God set you on. There are a lot of discouraged congregations, I think, around the country and around the world. But they don't often understand the nature of their discouragement. Oh, we're just behind the times. So let's jazz up the music and get with the times. We just don't have us a good preacher that's relevant and with it. It's our facilities and on and on it goes. Now listen, all those things could have some value, I suppose, but people want to look everywhere but themselves. Quit looking outside for the reason you do what you do or the reason you are what you are. Look inside and then look up for the help that's only found in Jesus Christ. But we also he, see here a dismayed leader. It's affected Joshua. Verse 6, Joshua rent his clothes, fell to the earth upon his face from the ark of the Lord until the eventide, and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over the Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites? Would to God we had been content to dwell on the other side of Jordan. I mean, even Joshua's reeling at this point. He's like, man, I should have just stayed over there. We defeat Jericho, and then we can't even dispatch of Ai. Oh, Lord, he says in verse 8, What shall I say then when Israel turneth their backs before the enemy? He's talking about them running like scared puppies back to camp. Joshua's, he's confounded. He's confused. He just can't figure it out. He, he kind of goes into a tailspin of sorts. He, he blames God, and he loses his vision for the whole entire campaign. 
Oh, I can't be too hard on Joshua because I've been there, done that. (laughs) I think like Joshua, we all sometimes look at all the wrong things when the first place we always need to look at is our own heart, to our own congregation, etc. We see the compromise. We see a horrible catastrophe. But then I want you to see the consequences. Dear friend, you must get this engraved on your heart and on your soul. You cannot get away with sin, you see. Look at these verses. First thing we see is the sinner is discovered. Verses 16 through 18 chronicles how this whole thing went down. God knew who was guilty. So we might ask the question, then why didn't he just tell Joshua who it was that they needed to be looking for? In my opinion, he was giving Achan an opportunity to repent. So as God was closing in on him, it it should have brought about conviction and repentance, but such was not the case. God knows who it is from the tribe to the family of Achan. He knows what it is. He knew precisely what Achan had done and where he had hidden it. God knew where it was. He knew it was in the tent of Achan. You know, this kind of reminds me of one of those, you can go online, you know, and it reminds me of one of those satellite images that you can get from space, and it can just start to dial in tighter and tighter and tighter. You, you see the whole globe from space, and then it dials in a little bit closer to the North American continent, and then it focuses on the United States, and then it dials down to Sullivan County, Tennessee, and then it goes all the way down to Kingsport and then begins to focus on 1625 Lynn Garden Road, and then it focuses on the pew that you're sitting on, and the next thing you know, God's spotlight is on you. You cannot hide from God. Listen to these verses, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders his paths. Proverbs 5, 21. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, 3. Can anyone hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Jeremiah 23, verse 24. The Lord Jesus, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Luke chapter 2, verse 2. Sir, deleting your search history from the computer might hide it from your wife, but it won't hide it from God. Ma'am, deleting your text might hide it from your husband, but it won't hide it from God. Young person, teenager, a simple lie might hide it from your mom and daddy, but it won't hide it from God. Quite simply, you're already caught and you will eventually be discovered because Numbers 32, 23 says, Be sure your sin will find you out. Let me tell you something. God is never doing simply nothing. God is always sovereignly, sometimes secretly moving toward exposure. He's never out of touch with what's going on. We see the sin discovered. We even see the sin discussed. Now now that the sin was out in the open, it, it had to be dealt with. You see, so often the church doesn't want to do that, but it is a must. I don't have time this morning to deal with what's often referred to as church discipline, but the Bible gives us detailed instructions on how to go about it in Matthew chapter 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 6. Though I cannot deal with it today just as a result of time constrictions, I still want to point out a couple of things, however. I do want you to see in our passage today the compassion that's here. Joshua says in verse 19, Joshua says to Achan, he speaks to him. He says, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him and tell me what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Here's what I think I notice here in that verse of Scripture. Joshua refers to him as as son, not a biological son, but one of the many sons of Israel a follower and a believer in Yahweh. He doesn't berate him. He refers to him with dignity and respect. So hear me, while God hates sin, he still expects us to be compassionate with sinners 
even in our own congregation. We don't condone the sin, but we would still need to speak to someone about their sin with dignity and respect. Ephesians 4, 15. Speak the truth in love. And even though we might need to contend with someone and confront someone with their sin, we must still do that with a heart of compassion. And I would say to you, if you're not ready to deal with it in a heart of compassion, you're not ready to deal with it at all. Because the goal of church discipline is not to kick people out of church. The goal of church discipline is to help move brothers and sisters back into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. That last option is the last option if they refuse to repent. So we see the compassion, but we also see the confession. Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus I have done. Uh, Finally, Achan confesses his guilt. However, I believe, like many of the commentators that I've read on this story, um, they don't believe for a minute that Achan is actually repentant. They're saying that his confession is the, Hey, I got caught confession. And I don't know if we have any way to absolutely determine which type of confession that it is, but I think one of the things that you notice here is perhaps maybe it's not genuine confession and repentance, and it leads to his death, but it may be genuine confession and repentance, and it still leads to his death. Sometimes, church, the consequences of sin are irrevocable. It's true. I gave a scenario earlier on. I said perhaps there's, there's a, a, a young girl that, that goes out here and gets her, you know, ends up pregnant out of, out of a sexual relationship, out of, out of the confines of marriage. She's, she's 18, 19 years old. And you know what I want you to know, young lady, if that's ever happened to you, and by the way, the boy that had his part in it too, amen, let's don't put this off on our, our, on our young women. It's two parties there. You know that God can and will Forgive that individual, restore them back to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But guess what? There's a baby on the way. She may or may not forfeit her opportunity at a college education. She may be thrust right into the workforce right off the bat and may not be able to do that. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that even though there can be Forgiveness and restoration, there's still some consequences. There's still some seeds that went in the ground that's got to come up. Now, there's grace there, and God may in wonderful ways help her and that young man to to overcome all that, but not always. It can radically change your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but sorrow of the world produces death. You see, that sorrow of the world is just simply the, oh man, I, I, I got caught. It's not genuine repentance, but just the I got caught. How can we know when it's genuine repentance? It's Proverbs 28, 13. I preached on this verse to our men last month. It says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but he who confesses, and forsakes them will find mercy. It's the confessing and the forsaking that gives evidence of actual repentance. So in these final moments that we have together this morning, I, I want to bring this to a conclusion by giving you three myths about sin. Three myths about sin. Myth number one, one sin won't hurt. In our rationalization, we might say that. One sin won't hurt anything. It's just one night out with the boys. It's, it's just one fling. It's just one glimpse at the computer screen. It's just one little lie. It's just one sip. It's just one little sin. I'll try not to even enjoy it. But oh, what damage can come from just one sin Achan lost everything because of one sin. Adam and Eve committed one sin and plunged all of humanity into death. Moses from one sin was forbidden to enter into the promised land. Ananias and Sapphira was killed and died because of one sin. Perhaps someone has contemplated an immoral affair and you're buying into the myth of one time won't hurt. Your spouse won't see it that way. 
Some teenage boy and girls thinking about having premarital sex and you think one time won't hurt. After all, we love each other. One time will hurt because it'll strip you of your God-given purity that you can never get back. Somebody here is thinking about fudging on some numbers in a business deal or on your taxes and you say, this one time won't hurt. I deserve this anyway. Be sure that your sin will find you out. It'll hurt. It's a myth. Myth number two, one sin won't hurt anybody else. Oh, yeah? 36 soldiers lost their life in Ai because of the sin of Achan. I think they would beg to differ. 36 wives without a husband would beg to differ. 36 or more children without a daddy would beg to differ. 36 mothers without a son would beg to differ. Achan's family who lost their lives would beg to differ. Sin won't hurt anybody else. Tell that to, to the 18 to 20,000 people who will die as innocent victims in alcohol-related traffic crashes every year. Tell that to broken-hearted parents who pray with tears every day for that wayward and rebellious child. Tell it to the girl that I'm thinking about right now who was friends with one of my daughters whose daddy committed adultery and now she's brokenhearted and has all kinds of insecurities and a variety of other issues because her daddy was unfaithful. Well, you know, Pastor, what I do in the privacy of my home and in my own house is my business. It may be, but you cannot sin in a vacuum. It will affect other people. Myth number three, and I'm done. One sin will not affect my future. We have taken the goodness and the forgiveness of God and gambled with it like it's a rabbit's foot. Oh, I can do this one thing and God will forgive me. It'll be all right. It's just this one time. It's not like it's going to compromise my future or anything. I've got an uncle that I never got to meet. He was my mama's brother. I have his shotgun. It's, it's well over 50 years old. It's probably 75 years old or more. When he was a teenager, he decided to run away from home. And I won't get into all the details about that, but he hopped on the back of a motorcycle with a friend, and they took off. And they took a curve fast between Sampson and Florella, Alabama. The bike left the road, and the driver got a few bumps and bruisers, but my uncle lost his life. Let me tell you something. One bad decision didn't just taint his future. It took his future. You say, one sin won't ruin my life. It's a myth. It can. Now I want to bring this to a conclusion because I know this is a heavy message. And some people just may leave today and think, well, that pastor's just angry. I'm not angry. I'm passionate. I'm trying to keep somebody from going over the cliff's edge this morning. Verse 24, believe, read with me if you would. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And he brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? And the Lord trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire for after they had stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of this place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Achor means trouble. Man, did Achan get himself into some trouble, amen? He brought trouble to himself, he brought trouble to his family, and he brought trouble to Israel. And you too, if you are walking in persistent and unrepentant sin, you're headed for trouble. So they placed where Achan was executed. They placed stones there, and it became known as the Valley of Achor or the Valley of Trouble. With that in mind, let me read another verse. Listen to what God says to his precious people of Israel later on down the road. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 15, he says, I will give her, speaking of Israel, I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. This same valley of trouble 
would be transformed into the valley of hope. And in spite of Israel's sinful and rebellious past, she would march on and defeat all of Canaan after the sin was eradicated from the camp. And Hosea chapter 2 verse 15 is pointing towards something even greater. Hosea chapter 2 is a millennial passage. It's a reference to the millennial reign, that time when Paul promised us in Romans that Israel would one day turn her eyes toward the Messiah and recognize him and receive him as her own. You see, it's pointing to the time when Israel would finally recognize Jesus for who he was. They will repent of their sins. They will be glorified along with the church, and they will occupy her land with joy, obedience, and incomparable fruitfulness. What grace! The valley of Achor, the valley of trouble, even there it can become a door of hope and only Jesus can take the valley of trouble and make it the door of hope, the valley of hope. The place of sorrow and defeat can be made into a place of joy and hope. There is a cure for an aching heart. It's Jesus. This altar that's right here in front of me and in front of you can be your door of hope. If you are genuinely repentant, there is indeed forgiveness and there is reconciliation with holy God. For some this morning, this message may spare you untold destruction. You're right on the edge of making a horrible, sinful decision. In Jesus' name, turn away from it before destruction comes to full bloom. Is there sin in your camp? Are you taken of banned things of God? Tucking them away in your life at work, at home, at play, brothers and sisters. What's in your tent? Church, we, think about it from the church perspective, we must be clean to know the blessing of God in this body. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, here's the good news. You don't have to be stoned and burned. (laughs) And that's, by the way, being stoned and burned, that's child's play compared to what eternal separation from God will be. Jesus took that for you on the cross. Come to him and be forgiven. Now, when a preacher preaches a message like this, I think the enemy immediately starts his onslaught. And he's going to say things like this to you. You know, the preacher just specifically preached on sin. And if you get up out of your cheek and go down out of your pew and go down there to the pew, everybody in the whole congregation is going to think you're involved in some deep, dark sin. Well, let me tell you, give you two words of real, real, real good advice. Who cares? Being right with God is preeminent here. Amen? That's what's important. That's what's critical. And by the way, I ain't thinking that. I don't think anybody else is either. I think that's the words of the enemy. I think that's a lie from the devil. We all should congregationally, corporately seek holiness and righteousness in our life. I'm not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination, but what I'm trying my best to do is keep short accounts with my Lord and Savior. Repent frequently, repent often. Don't allow some sin to get in your life and and be hidden away and fester and bring disease and toxic results in your life. So the invitation is rather clear this morning. If you need to be born again, come. What is a valley of trouble, which is the result of sin, can be a door of hope for you this morning in Jesus Christ. I'll be waiting right down front here in a moment. Would you just come simply say, Brother Richard, I need to be saved. I need to be born again. Christians, allow the Spirit of the living God to search your heart, to seek your heart, expose whatever's there, and then you quickly dispatch of it and deal with it and repent of it before God. Listen. When we get out there and we try to live a Lone Ranger Christian life, that's when we're out to be in the most trouble. So I urge you this morning, if you don't have a church home, unite with the church home with a group of brothers and sisters that can help urge you on in the things of God and encourage you in the things of God. That can keep you from a world of hurt in and of itself. 